Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is October 2nd, 2017, and my guest is historian and author Jennifer Burns of Stanford University. She's currently working on a biography of Milton Friedman. Her first book, which is the subject of today's conversation, is Goddess of the Market, Ayn Rand and the American Right. It's published in 2009 by Oxford University Press. Jennifer, welcome to Econ Talk. Thanks for having me. So on the surface, um, a biography of Ayn Rand seems like an unusual topic for a historian. What drew you to, the, to, to her and, um, and, and why is she important in history? Um, you know, it's a great question. And I um, started graduate school in the year 2000. And I was interested in intellectual history. I was interested in religious history. I was sort of exploring. And it just so happened that I kept coming across Ayn Rand. Um, it was like this weird thing where, you know, I might get on the bus and see someone's buried in Atlas Shrugged. Or I might go to a friend's house who never, ever reads. And there she's got Atlas Shrugged by her bedside. And I started thinking, what, what's up with Ayn Rand? She's a historical figure. She existed in history. Like, I should learn about her. And so I went to the library and I looked at the shelf of books on Rand and I noticed a couple things. First of all, it was a much smaller shelf than you would find for, you know, any other author um, as widely read as her. And secondly, I could divide that shelf in half, basically, to books that said, Ayn Rand is a terrible person who ruined my life and her philosophy is the root of all evil, to Ayn Rand is the most brilliant thinker since Aristotle. And it sort of occurred to me there had to be a middle story somewhere between these two poles. And at the same time, I was in graduate school in American history and historians, you know, working in the academy were starting to think about conservatism more seriously, starting to write about it, starting to wonder about it. And so these two things sort of came together, this sort of growing interest I had in this curious figure I just wanted to learn more about. And then this realization she'd actually been quite influential in the conservative movement, and that was this growing area of scholarship, and maybe I could put these together and come up with a suitable topic for a dissertation. Had you read much or any of her work at that point? You know, I had. I read The Fountainhead in college. It was given to me by a family member who said, you know, you're at the point in life where you should read The Fountainhead. And, um, you know, it took a little bit in sort of a curious way. Um, I read the whole book. I didn't love it. I felt like I didn't get it, though. And so I think that part of that stuck stuck with me. Like, she's making references. She's making allusions. She's doing something here that I'm not quite getting. And so um, I actually felt a little resentful that this book had gone over my head because it was so long. I made myself read it. Um, So I think that's part of why I came back to it. And I had, you know, dipped a little bit into the virtue of selfishness, which, you know, talked a lot about this revolutionary new morality. kind of seemed intriguing to me as a college student. But again, I didn't. Um, didn't click or didn't gel with it in that way. And so, you know, I think for me as a historian, someone who's always interested in the broader context or the longer story, I really, I found the way to approach Rand for me is by looking at her life and how it kind of interweaves with the lives of other people um, that she met and she encountered. And that's that's what I ended up writing about in the book. Yeah, it's a really, um, it's a fascinating book that I learned a lot, a, a lot from and I should put my historical cards on the table. I, I read – I think I probably read Atlas Shrugged or my first Rand when I was in, in high school. Again, a family – like you, a family friend gave me this book and said you're going to find this interesting, and I certainly did. And somewhere you know, through my college years, I read most of her books, maybe close to all of them. Um, and I remember my – that – culminated in some sense of culmination with uh, Anarchy, State, and Utopia by Robert Nozick when I was a senior in, in college. I, I read that. And those books had a huge impact on me um, along with Milton Friedman. Those those three people, Nozick, Friedman, and Rand had a huge impact on me. And I've, I've mentioned Ayn Rand's name 
I would say 10, maybe 10 times on this program over this almost 600 episodes we've done. Uh, we've never done an episode on her work, so I'm excited to talk about that with you. But I, at some point in my life, I got disenchanted with Rand's, um, with the virtue of selfishness. And it, it strikes me that I, I may have been unfair to her. You're scrupulously fair, it seems to me, to her in, in your book. And, and we'll talk about that that whole um, – the question of what selfishness means and, and also the way that you treat her. But I want to start with a little bit with her personality. Uh, she was – I did not know until I read your book how extraordinarily charismatic that she she was. Uh, I didn't realize that with uh, the help of an inner circle of friends and acolytes that she created – a slightly frightening well, – I would say frightening. I'm not going to say slightly. A frightening cult of personality around her philosophy and her writing. So talk about her personality and the devotion and passion of her followers and how that played out in the in the 60s uh, politically and culturally. Yeah, um, it's interesting. So she did have a very powerful charisma. She also had a very powerful negative charisma, which I think goes back to that bookshelf. You know, some people just – Hey, Ayn Rand, they cannot stand her. They have a very visceral negative reaction. And others, especially those who met her at the right moment, um, just sort of fell under her spell. And I think some of that goes to her very unusual personality where, I mean, she was what she wrote about in terms of being um, a, a true individualist, very solitary. Doesn't mean she didn't care about other people or have strong emotions or want the high regard of other people. That's, she absolutely did want that. Um, but she was free from a lot of the um, sort of striving for status and power and positioning. So she could have a very neat perspective on someone when she met them. And she could have, for all her difficulty reading other people's emotions, she sometimes would get a very sort of deep and pure insight into your core. And she could give that to a person and just win their their unending loyalty. Now, that then might become a sort of dominance relationship where she was so overwhelming. She was so quick. She had thought so much about what she stood on every issue that it was very hard to disagree with her. And she would sort of use this logical web of, you know, if you agree in rationality, you know, here are my first premises. You agree with my first premises is now here we go. You can't break free because I've already got you to agree on the basics and you're going to follow me wherever I go. And it started going in very strange directions in terms of the type of music you could listen to, the types of movies that these premises would lead you to. And so, um, I mean, you called it frightening, this sort of cult of personality. I'd, I'd add a couple of things to that. Um, so as I describe in my book, when she moved to New York in the mid fifties, she had a whole series of encounters with conservatives some of whom began to follow her philosophy, uh, many of whom did for a short while and then sort of broke away or like yourself found various things missing or inadequate. And then she pulled to her a group of college students, um, or actually recent college graduates, centered around a young couple, Barbara Brandon and Nathaniel Brandon. And they became sort of the core um, set of her social life and her intellectual life and her, her world. And they pulled in others among them. Alan Greenspan is kind of the most famous member of this group that called themselves the collective. And a couple things I would say, um, you know, we'll get to the, I assume we'll get to the relationship with the Brandons, which is sort of its own set of discussions. But um, what I really came to see is the fifties and the sixties for intellectuals and cultural figures were kind of the age of the entourage like you weren't anybody until you had an entourage, like, right. Think about like Frank Lloyd, Wright. He had Taliesin. He had all these people designing like him. Um, it was sort of a mark of, of status and accomplishment. If you had this entourage and also for Rand, who was outside of any type of institution, she wouldn't have graduate students. She wouldn't have, um, you know, necessarily proteges in the typical way that she would hire or, or in that way, they would simply become part of her social world. Now, you called it scary, and it is true. There's a lot of first-person eyewitness testimony that to be in this tight inner circle, very close to Rand, could be very psychologically damaging for people and sort of stifling, and that you, to stay there long-term, you had to, and this is this giant grand paradox, suppress your own individuality in order to support Rand's specific idea of what individualism was. 
And so in that inner core, it was like, I mean, Murray Rothbard has this incredible letter. I don't know, know if your listeners will be familiar with Rothbard, an anarcho-capitalist, um, you know, very libertarian. And he, he met Rand and he kind of went hot and cold on her. And then eventually he sent her this letter that was like, when I met you, you were like this sun and I thought you would burn me up if I got too close, you know? <laughs> and so if you knew Rand in New York in the fifties, that was, that could be a dangerous spot. Now, if you were a couple degrees out and you read her book at the right time in the right place, it might change your life and it might change your life for the better. I mean, I regularly meet, and this is actually an interesting kind of angle of her and her relationship with women and gender. I all the time meet women who read her at a certain moment in their lives and said, things are different for me since I read that book. You know, I just met a woman who said, when I first read Ayn Rand, I thought I was going to be a nurse. And after I finished Ayn Rand, I was like, no, I'm going to be a doctor. <laughs> and she became a doctor. You know, And so that aspect of Rand, I think, um, is um, also really important. And people can get over-focused on this cult in New York because it's so interesting and fascinating and kind of weird. But I really think the true impact of Rand is several. If you think of concentric circles of influence or readership around her, it's not that tight knit group. It's a few out is where you really have people um, being impacted by her philosophy in ways personal and ways political. Well, as you point out, it's a little bit of a paradox. These people, she demanded total loyalty, uh, which is ironic given her stress on individualism and, and reason. But her view was, I'm right. Everything else is wrong. And therefore, if you don't follow me and agree with everything I say, obviously there's something wrong with your powers of reason. But it it, it has a um, – for it has a religious feel to it, and she's an anti-religious person. It has a cult feel to it, and she's an individualist. And the group called themselves the collective, which is weird because right. she's not – she's an opponent of collectivism. Well, it was supposed to be tongue-in-cheek, right? Like, ha-ha. And eventually it's like, well, joke's on you because yeah. you did become very collectivistic. I mean, you know, we sort of go back and forth on this. I think one issue, the individualism piece – is an element there, but a lot of it was this idea of rationality and this idea that she was going to create a new ethical system based on rational thought. And cults of reason have happened before and they'll happen again. Um, and it was that that reason which she then joined to this, you know, idea of, of individualism, but um, you could imagine another version of individualism that would be sort of expressive individualism or, you know, go with the flow or go with your gut or, you know, um, follow your intuition, more of a Rousseauian romantic individualism. And that was not her. She was very clear um, that rationality was the defining feature of um, humankind. That was what separated us from the animals. That was what made us unique. And that was what we needed to cultivate. And she became very suspicious of um, emotional life, feelings, things that couldn't be controlled. And so she really set reason and emotion against each other and insisted that reason must win. And then the final irony is that the whole scene kind of blew up in this cataclysm of emotion. Yeah. Um, well, we should probably talk about that. And I'll mention uh, to parents listening with young children, you may want to listen to this next part before you uh, continue listening with your kids if you're on your way to school. But she um, she had – she was married um, through her – entire life until the death of her husband. Uh, but Nathaniel and Barbara Brandon, who were also married, uh, they ended up getting divorced and presumed partly, if not totally, because Nathaniel and Ayn Rand had a longstanding, quote, secret affair, but not secret to the to the people and their spouses. That's what's what's bizarre about it. And when Brandon goes off to find a different woman later on uh, in his life, Ayn Rand totally um, – and she have, we have to make it clear. Ayn Rand originally dedicates uh, Atlas Shrugged to Nathaniel Brandon and to her husband. Mm -hmm. And when when Nathaniel leaves uh, for another woman, leaves romantically, um, Ayn Rand – well, explain what happens. It's, it's kind of extraordinary and, yeah. and why it was so hard for her intellectually to deal with his defection romantically. Yeah, well, let me go back a little bit to kind of set the stage for the relationship. Um, you know, 
one thing I uncovered in my research that was sort of interesting is as she became famous, so she became famous for The Fountainhead. She then spent some time in Hollywood where she was working on the screen adaptation. And she would have fans write her letters all the time, and she would often meet them. And it looks like there were a couple of young men um, with whom she got close to maybe having a, r- a romantic relationship. Never quite happened, but looking back, they said maybe this was in the cards somewhere. She, she met, was married at the time. And she was married at the time. She was married to her opposite, a lovely, soft, kind, um, yielding, um, passive, passive almost, yeah. Um, uh, artistic uh, man who, you know, uh, basically he was the wife in the relationship, according to the gendered standards of the day. You know, he he didn't work. He minded the home. He supported her. He was very good. Not financially. At, she supported him yeah, financially. Sorry. Which he su- Yeah, exactly. She was a breadwinner, but he was the one who would, um, you know, help her through her tough times with her writing. Um, help her socially, support her socially. They'd go to a party. He'd be at her side, introducing people, just kind of making things flow well. Um, and so at any rate, um, you know, but it, it apparently lacked the passion that she wanted. She was very drawn to Nathaniel Brandon. Um, Who was and then much younger than she was. Much younger, 25 years younger. They first met. Um, he sent her a letter. He actually sent her two letters. He was at UCLA. He came to visit her. They stayed up all night talking. He came back. He brought Barbara Brandon. He stayed up all night talking. And they sort of embarked on this very intense intellectual relationship where she saw him as the person who would carry forward her ideas, learn her ideas. They'd moved to New York. In large part, the Brandons moved to New York to continue their education. And Rand essentially followed. She came out very shortly after. And um, it was in, within a year or so the relationship became romantic between her and Nathaniel Brandon. Now, at this point, they sought the consent of Barbara Brandon and her husband, Frank O'Connor. And originally, they sought the consent for, they said they had fallen in love and they just wanted some time together. Eventually, they came back a couple months later and said, this is now going to be romantic time together and we want you to agree. And they said, sure, okay, we agree. This makes sense. You guys are both sort of geniuses. You should be together. We're all adults. We're all adults. We can all agree. Um, but We're then not going to let emotion get in the way of these intellectual right, we, relationships. We rationally understand this makes emotional sense, if you yeah. will. And then, but they the secret stopped there. So you know, Rand could be very unconventional, but she did not want this secret to get out. So it became this sort of this pretty toxic not secret secret, right? The, the players right immediately involved, but apparently nobody else knew. And looking back, once it came out, people were like, oh, how could we have missed this? You know, the dedication to the book, right? And your readers out there, you should grab your copy of Atlas Shrugged if you've got one with a double dedication, like hang on to it. That's that's worth something, I imagine. Um, and it's a historical curio. Um, so, so this progresses and then the book Atlas Shrugged comes out. It's her masterpiece. She's worked so hard on it, and it was just universally panned. Critics really hated it. Um, it didn't get, like, a single good book review. Now, it sold like hotcakes. People loved it. She had an incredible fan base, but, you know, to the extent that the, the book review crowd was more liberal, more elitist, they just didn't like this novel at all. They weren't going to give it the time of day. And the publisher was actually pretty stunned that the book sold so many copies despite being so widely panned. So she was she was depressed, though. You know, she she wanted to be greeted as a major thinker on the scene. And instead, she was basically made fun of by anybody who was anybody. So Brandon said, you know what? You've got a fan base. People want to learn about your stuff. I'm going to start a school dedicated to your philosophy. He called it the Nathaniel Brandon Institute, or NBI was how it was abbreviated. And he started, they put an ad in the New York Times, you know, lectures by Ayn Rand, lectures about Ayn Rand's philosophy, and it said something like, you know, at the conclusion of the lecture series, Miss Rand will consent to appear and answer questions. And um, they started, and it, it was successful, it was popular, it grew, they franchised it, they would record the lectures, and then you could be a representative in Los Angeles or Chicago, get together a bunch of people, collect a fee, and play the tape recording. Um, and they had a newsletter pe- with 20,000 yeah, subscribers, uh-huh. which is a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's a newsletter that rivals those little magazines we spend so much time writing about. 
Um, you know, it, uh, they had other people doing affiliated lectures. I think Greenspan gave a lecture on like business, like, you know, you had people doing all kinds of stuff. It grew and grew and grew into this real, um, intellectual community it, and it had ties to the growing conservative movement. Um, it was never conservative per se because she staked out, you know, positions that would be anathema to religious conservatives, but it was, it was an important part of that 60s conservative moment. And as it went on, Brandon became, you know, he became, he made good money. I don't know exactly wealthy, but fairly, you know, this was his living. He became well known. He became um, sort of a celebrity within this world. His whole world was built around Ayn Rand. Yet at the same time, he was losing interest in that romantic relationship and he didn't know what to do. And he basically decided he couldn't tell Rand. And so he sort of dissembled and fabricated at the same time as he began becoming involved with another woman. But and so she, let's cut to the punchline. When she finds yeah. out she totally destroys his empire of, of affiliated material, uh, threatens him legally. And that whole movement, the whole cult of personality is, is jarred tremendously by this. And for me, as a um, someone who's become more skeptical of the power of reason as I've gotten older, it, it's it's a it's an incredibly um, fitting end to this story. It's a tragic end, but it's incredibly fitting. These people who thought that the only thing that mattered was reason were torn apart by an emotional uh, response to to their relationship. Yeah, I mean, it just blew sky high. The whole movement. And it, there was a giant schism, and nobody was told the reason. It was, like, unspecified. It was, like, dishonesty and corruption. So nobody knew. People were having wild speculations. Did he steal money? Did he do this? Did he do that? And it basically became you took the Brandon side or you took Ayn Rand's side. I mean, families have split. There are people who never spoke to each other again for the rest of their lives. Um, and then a lot of people just watching from the outside looking in were like, this whole thing is Looney Tunes crazy. It cost Rand a great deal of credibility. It basically brought her career to a screeching halt. Brandon took off to California and started doing New Age stuff. Um, you know, objectivism would kind of roll on as itself. But but you're right. That was really the cataclysmic moment. And, you know, it came out of this environment where you had to be reasonable. And that that meant in this, you know, culture, pushing all of your emotions aside. And then, boy, did they come rushing back. Yeah, it's just... Um in a way, her personal life was a test case for at least a part of her a lab experiment for her part of her philosophy. But let's move to the to the uh, the economics part of it. W one of the uh, not that they're unrelated, but one of the things that I found striking about reading your book was the being reminded of her moral defense of capitalism and how jarring it is to a modern ear, which is relentlessly utilitarian and efficient and practical. And she ha would have none of that. She, of course, I, re I remember it now as when I think back on it, but she only cared about the morality. She didn't care about the utilitarian part of it. Yeah, she really, it's true. I actually am I'm just um, writing up this episode now where she gets in a big fight with Milton Friedman, who was kind of talking about the efficiency of markets. And she just thought this was like a horrible way to go, that you had to talk about the ethics of it. And I think that comes, you know, more than anything from her experience in Russia um, so she was born um, in a, a sort of bourgeois Russian family, a Russian Jewish family, and they were, she was about 12, and she was 12 when the Russian Revolution unfolded around her, and her family's livelihood was basically taken by the state, um, confiscated, and she just thought that was the sort of ethical corruption and rot at the, at the core of the modern world, that you could say, somebody needs this more than you, I'm going to take it. Or you don't really own this. This isn't really yours. I'm going to take it. And it was to her, she kind of drilled down to what she thought was going on. And it was to her, a group of people, the collective, being placed against one person, the individual. And so that was the essence of it. And the reason that capitalism was, she called the best moral and social system, was that it was built on the rights of the individual. And it allowed the individual to flourish. And so any... Um, any discussion of the ways capitalism was bad or needed to be moderated came back to her as 
potentially threatening that sovereign individual. So for her, capitalism, you know, she claimed it in its pure form had never been known. In its pure form, it would be very close to anarchy with a, a very minimal state, and it would allow individuals to sort out for themselves um, what they wanted out of life and to compete freely, um, you know, in in a market economy and in, on a contractual basis of, you know, peer-to-peer, equal-to-equal. So I'm, I'm very sympathetic to that view, uh, as you just stated it. Uh, the part that I would add, and I'd love to get your reaction as to what she, how she would react to this, the part that I would add is that Commercial dealing is what we do voluntarily with each other. We choose to contract with each other, choose to buy or sell from each other. That competition is very powerful in protecting people and in creating excellence. Uh, at the same time, I would in, I would be a champion of people who want to voluntarily get together to help other people. So to form charities, foundations, philanthropy, and so on. To me, that's the other aspect of you know what's often called civil society. It's the things that we do together, but not through force, not through the ballot box, not through taxation, but through our individual choices of what we're passionate about and what we think helps make the world a better place. Uh, would you say she would be opposed to that those activities when she talks about the virtue of selfishness, say, or does she just not want people to feel compelled to do them? You know, it's more the latter, but it's a little bit tricky. So she would say, of course, you are perfectly free – you know, to act in an altruistic manner or to, to support other people on your own time as long as it's free and voluntary choice. But that's not the essence of morality. And so people who consider themselves teachers of ethics and morality should not be emphasizing that behavior and should not be holding that up as a standard of behavior. We've had far too much of that. What we should hold up as a standard of behavior instead is people like the people in my books, Howard Rourke, John Galt, paragons of individualism and we need to recognize that that is an ethical life and so she really she didn't want you to emphasize that other stuff she would assume subsume it and put it way down under free choice like yada yada sure you could do this with your free choice but the important thing is the free choice not um, that your free choices are to help other people and you know that was what I think really people really disliked about her is that she just downplayed all that and she didn't think there was a role for that type of moral encouragement. Now, I think I think that she was deliberate about that. Part of it was having grown up in Russia and having been subject to propaganda. Um, she felt there were you know ways that political leaders um, could use propaganda and persuasion and, and those were inappropriate and the state certainly shouldn't be doing that and political leaders shouldn't be doing that. She also came to believe that Christian morals were, as she put it, the kindergarten of communism, that it was Christianity that taught people it's right to care about others, to be your brother's keeper. And that once people believe that those sets of actions were moral, um, they were, they could be at the victim of a political leader or a status system that said, I'm doing this for other people. It's the right thing to do. That if you'd already agreed that was true, you didn't have any ground to stand on to object. So she would put the things you're describing, voluntary charity, she'd put them way at the bottom of her list of things people should talk about. Now that then goes to her sort of theory of human nature, which in some ways was fairly optimistic. Um, in that you didn't need um, leaders to encourage social norms and proper behavior um, because people would, would sort of rationally follow their own interests. And she didn't spend a lot of time thinking about um, the bad sides of self-interest. That wasn't her task. Her task was, her self-appointed task was, I'm going to talk about what's good about self-interest. And if she was given any example of how self-interest might be bad, she would usually say, well, that's not really true self-interest. Um, you know, that, you know, to get a fortune through a crime is not really a true self-interest because it shows a, a lack of regard for, you know, the integrity of yourself. And, you know, eventually you're like, okay, yeah, whatever. But some people want to like lie, rob, cheat, and steal, you know, <laughs> and, and that's a form of, of selfishness. So, um, I, I mean, I think what made a lot of the system tick and hold together is that she really elaborated and expressed it in fiction in which she had a great deal of control over her characters and she didn't have to 
grapple with observed human behavior. She could just idealize and make it up. I just want to emphasize one of the themes that comes through in the book that I, I mentioned earlier, but I, it, I, it's hard to understate how powerful it was. If you asked a question or showed doubt in one of her, these seminars or in her salon uh, on Saturday nights, it wasn't like, oh, that's interesting. Let's see where that goes. It was like it, you were just – the way you describe it, you were just cut off. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it, it got really bad after Atlas Shrugged. Um, you know, and there's a lot of different relationships I sort of trace. Um, earlier in her life, she was more open. She was sort of saw herself as an up and coming thinker who could take the time to recruit people to the cause and to sort of rectify error and change minds. Once she was done with Atlas Shrugged, she's like, I'm done. Here's the book. Read it. There's nothing wrong with it. You know, and if you think there's something wrong with it, I'm going to talk to this other person over here. Check your premises. Check your premises. And I think that, you know, the other theme that that I talk about in the book and I, you know, is she was a lifelong user of amphetamines. And this, again, was fairly common in the literary culture of the day. She got prescribed um, this like Benzedrine was the the name of it back then. It's basically low level speed. She got prescribed it um, for weight loss, I think, you know, and she kept taking it and she just took a lot of it. And over time, that can definitely change your personality. It can exacerbate the need for control, um, rigidity, uh, anger, irritability, all of that. So some of what we're seeing is, I think, her natural intellectual development, natural aging process. But I think you really got to factor the the lifelong abuse um, of this drug in there as well. I'm going to come back to the remark you made that uh, Christian morality was the kindergarten is the kindergarten of communism. Um, first, I want to I want to get there in a roundabout way. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was not a fan of of Milton Friedman. Uh, you mentioned a, a book, a study that Friedman wrote with Stigler that I remember reading a long long ago on uh, rent control. Mm-hmm. Uh, that she literally that was published by the Foundation for Economic Education, which is a free market uh, institution in upstate New York, and uh, she despised that study, even though it was critical of rent control, and she despised it because they were, Stigler and Freeman against it, quote, for the wrong reason. And she also despised uh, F.A. Hayek, who she called uh, poison uh, and something else. Uh, the word pernicious is in there. <laughs> uh, and and because he wasn't pure enough. So for, mm-hmm. talk about that, and then I want to come back to the kindergarten of communism remark. Talk about why she hated Friedman and Hayek. So, um, you know, like many ideologues, she really trained her fire, not on the other side, but on the sort of false flag, the people who she felt were semi on her side, but not enough. Um, So the problem with Hayek, you know, if you read The Road to Serfdom and and other works, he's talking about how can we do national health insurance? How can we do unemployment? You know, how can we do all this stuff while preserving the free market system? And she just thought that was like the opening wedge of, you know, to use his phrase, you know, the, the road to serfdom, right? If you if you said you needed these things in addition to capitalism, that was for her really problematic. Um, you know, Friedman, the particular pamphlet, um, they, t- they use the word rationing. They talked a lot about the word rationing, and they were using it both in the context of the war in which there was actual um, rationing of you know, goods during World War II. And then they were also using it in the economic sense in which a market can be said to ration goods by price because you need there's X amount of to, dollars. To not, get the enough, not enough to go around of everything. Just right. And so she actually thought they were communists and that this was a communist plot to like make a fake argument about free market economics because in addition to using this rationing language, you know, this was a moment in time when Friedman and Stigler were still talking a lot about social equality, and how that was important to them. But later, that theme really disappears in their work, but it was pretty strong at this um, immediate post-war moment. So she saw that, she saw the word rationing, and she thought these guys are pinks, they're plants, they're trying to subvert the development of an honest-to-God true free enterprise movement, which, to be true blue, would talk about how evil collectivism is and how the individual is the only ethical standard and how free market capitalism is the only system that upholds the individual and is ethical. So she couldn't stand either the value-free efficiency argument or the social justice equality argument or the compromise argument. So she 
Go ahead, sorry. She basically settled on Ludwig von Mises as the only economist whose views she could endorse. And she steered her readers to Mises. And I think she did a lot to sort of keep his work circulating um, in these lean years in the United States and to, you know, eventually grew into its own independent Austrian movement. But she was a very important ally for him. Yeah, and, but ironically, Rothbard, who's Mises is also with Hayek, Mises' protege, uh, she didn't get along with him ultimately, as she, as we discussed earlier. But it's interesting, you know, even today uh, among libertarians, um, there's a schism between people like me who think that I have a lot to learn from Hayek and Friedman. Even I, I might not agree with everything they say. That's okay. Uh, and you know, an, a more dramatic example of Friedman's. Uh, imperfection would be his uh, encouragement of, uh, uh, let's say, what would it be? A good example: uh, the negative income tax. Instead of eliminating the welfare state, we'll just do it more efficiently. Mm -hmm. Or another example might be: uh, I can't think of another example. It doesn't matter. But that, that, so he's persona non grata because he's he's willing to imagine the possible role for the government in helping poor people. Yeah and, yeah, and and Hayek similarly because he he wrote a sentence in or a paragraph or a page in the Road to Serfdom that said that the national that health insurance might be an appropriate role for the state, therefore he's out. And so mm -hmm. among people who listen to econ talk, I'm sure there's some out there. Uh, you know, I'm I'm suspect because I like Hayek and Friedman, and I don't I don't worship Mises enough. I don't know Mises' work as well as I know Hayek. So I don't know Mises' work at all, hardly. I read a, a little Mises. I didn't learn so much from him. He doesn't grab me the way Hayek and, and Friedman do. So I'm not a, I'm not an acolyte of any of them. They're, none of them are saints. None of them brought down their works from Mount Sinai. They're not holy. Um, they have things I learn from and things I don't, things I agree with, things I don't. But in the movement, I think, of, of free market folks and libertarians, there is the schism still between Friedman Hayek on the one side and Mises and Rothbard on the other, that they're, they're – um, they're okay, uh, Mises and, and Rothbard, because they're uncompromising, and the other guys are, you know, not okay. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I think I think most of it was a character-driven um, and philosophically driven uh, outcome, you know, an, an opinion or, or, or stance. You could also think of it um, as having some strategic value in terms of I'm going to stake out the furthest possible edge because – that's how we get there, and compromising yeah. is not how we get there. And some people are inclined to compromise, and some not. But but it connected existentially to this very black and white view of the world, where she said there are two sides to every issue, right and wrong, and the worst is gray in the middle. There's no such thing. So it pervaded her thinking, um, her relationships, her fiction. That was just who she was, you know. So yeah, she she aligned herself up with Mises. They didn't know each other. Um, they spent time together, and then she funneled readers of this, you know, pretty big newsletter. She would funnel them to Mises. She'd say, go to Mises. She'd sell his books through her book service, all of that. Yeah, I don't see any, you know, I, my view is it's okay to be, um, well, I don't even think that's okay. I was going to say, I just, gray is fine for me. Uh, I just want to make a case for gray uh, <laughs> because, again, for me, the question is who do I learn from? And if I can learn from somebody, yeah. uh, I'm okay with it. Um, uh I'm a big follower of the dictum of the Talmud that says, ask the question, who is wise? The person who learns from, from everyone rather than uh, the one who follows, you know, such and such a uh, creed or whatever. But it, it's, it's just interesting to me how that intellectual, that ideological purity test uh, remains important to folks uh, yeah. 50, 60 years later and will probably continue to do so. But I want to come back to your point about the kindergarten of communism because mm -hmm. I think it's a really interesting tie into Hayek, even though she didn't like Hayek um, or thought he was flawed, which is – so Rand was an atheist. She hated religion, viewed it as a form of anti-reason, I assume, was one reason she hated it, if not more than reasons. But she also didn't like this moral – imperative of, of some religions to help other people. Uh, and it's interesting that she saw Christian morality as the kindergarten of communism. You know, it says in, it says in the Old Testament, love your neighbors yourself. Uh, that's not a very Randian thought. And what, what Hayek argues in The Fatal Conceit is that we have this natural tendency 
to take the ethics of our family and extend them out into the larger extended order of society at large. And I think that's what he saw, I think correctly, as the root attraction of socialism and of communism, that the family is a pretty great thing. And certainly in our family, we we care for each other and we take care of each other. And therefore, we need to do that more widely. And he said that's the road to tyranny. And if you try to take the extended order of the marketplace and bring it to the family, you're going to destroy the family. And so we need to live in two worlds at once, a world of small group ethics, which is the family or our close friends, and the larger order of strangers who we trade with and exchange with and interact with through the marketplace. And I think that was a, that's an incredibly deep insight into why uh, modern life is challenging, uh, politi- political economy is challenging. And it's interesting to me that he would have been very sympathetic to that remark that the morality of – she called it Christian morality, but it's also the morality of the family, that to love one's neighbors oneself, to love one's family members oneself, to care about others is the natural impulse toward collectivism. Yeah, um, that's a really interesting you know, way to think about it. For me with Rand, one interesting kind of thought experiment is like what if Rand and Frank O'Connor had a child? You know, like yeah. would that have <laughs> – would that have fed into her philosophical system or how would it have? Um, you know, now she did help some of her family members, but she tended to be, there's this whole series of letters in um, her Ayn Rand letters where she's basically offering support to her, um, one of her nieces and nephews and, you know, putting a lot of conditions on it. Like, I want you to go to school. I want you to do this. And like, please stop asking me for dresses again and again and again. Um, so it's true. She, she had an unusual family situation and that, you know, she, left Russia and she stayed in touch with her family, but then she lost contact with him over the war. She had, you know, she had a husband, she had a quasi family of people who believed in her philosophy. And one episode that happened later in her life, which I cover a bit in the book is that she actually discovered her sister, Nora, who she thought had died in the war. There was like a traveling, um, her, her photograph appeared in Russia as part of a, some type of intercultural exchange. And she was recognized. And her sister recognized her, and she actually brought her sister and husband to this country and expected this would have been her favorite sister, this great reunion, and they didn't get along. And they argued, and her sister defended communism. Yeah, that was... And it's just terrible. The relationship fell apart, and they went back to Russia, and they never spoke again. And so, you know, she had that moment later in her life, that chance to reconnect, and it was very clear that her ideology was more important than her family ties, you know, couldn't have been clearer. And it was just a missed, missed moment. And so I think that's also why, you know, the, the, the rap on Rand is like teenagers lover, you know? Um, and I always say teenagers of all ages lover, right? But, um, you know, there is, a, there is a very common pattern that people really feel strongly about Rand at a certain point in their life. And then later when they've had, more relationships, more complicated experiences in life, they look back and they say, it's not really capturing what I now know to be true. Um, and I think part of that comes out of her own biography and a really unusual personality. It takes an unusual personality to sort of make history and to stay alive as an intellectual force, you know, 50 years, you know, 100 years in time. But it also makes means you're not really an ordinary person. You have trouble speaking to that experience. It really, you know, it, it reminded me a lot of Steve Jobs, um, Walter Isaacson's biography paints him, I think, in a very um, mixed way, which is that he's a very difficult person to get along with, and yet people want to be around him all the time. And I mm-hmm. felt the same response here uh, to to Rand. Before we leave religion, I just want to add one – ask you to talk about one more thing, which is really important I didn't know anything about, which is uh, she was um, very much an, uh, an antagonist of William F. Buckley's in both directions – Yes. And I didn't know about that. So talk about the role that religion played and in, in especially in how the Buckley and the National Review in the uh, 50s were, were revitalizing conservatism but saw libertarianism, which is sometimes thought of as on the conservative spectrum and, of course, it is to some extent, uh, was, was dangerous. And similarly, Ayn Rand viewed Buckley and the conservative uh, rise in the 50s and 60s in National Review as, as a bad thing as well. Yeah, I mean, it was sort of a turf war, you know, it was a battle over who gets to control this movement, and what do we call it, and what's important to it. And Rand had been kind of involved during the early war years, the, the late 30s, early 40s, 
and she saw Buckley and his ilk coming along. And, um, you know, there's this famous moment where she meets Buckley and she says the first, like first words out of her mouth is like, how, how can someone so intelligent still believe in God? And, you know, it just rubs Buckley the wrong way. You know, she's kind of a high modernist, bohemian, anti-religious, pro-rationality. And he's trying to bring back, you know, Catholic conservatism and, and religious conservatism. And so I think Buckley's perspective is free markets are great. But we need them to be married with more traditional um, ideas about virtue and restraint, um, because if left to themselves, you know, markets may encourage all kinds of self-destructive or selfish behavior. So we need to kind of modify that. And guilt is good. And having people worry about social norms is good. And Rand's the total opposite. You know, we need to free markets from these atavistic ideas about morality. We need to free all of ourselves from guilt um, we need to move forward and pursue our own um, interests and fulfill our own personalities and lead the ethical life that way. And we need to create a new morality that supports that. So they couldn't have been more opposite. And, you know, Buckley kind of took some joy at needling her. Like he sent her these postcards. I would find these postcards in her archive would be like, hey, I saw you getting into a taxi and I waved and you didn't wave back, you know. And meanwhile, she's like, I hate you. <laughs> Because then he did sort of the ultimate. He had her book to review, and he the Atlas shrugged, and he gave it to Whitaker Chambers. This is who, nineteen. This is nineteen. This is nineteen fifty-seven. Yeah, yeah. And Chambers wrote this just incredible review. It's it's well worth rereading today. And he basically said this this so so Chambers had discovered religion and was working hand in hand with Buckley to you know bring back a sort of Christian conservatism and make it a part of the fight against um, Russian communism and part of the fight against domestic liberalism. And he was speaking as a veteran of these wars, as a former communist spy, all of that. And so he takes one look at Rand and he says, this is, this is false freedom. This is false individualism. This is a totalitarianism of the right. It's a totalitarianism of reason and individualism. And he said, basically, the last line of the review is something like, to a gas chamber, go. Like, the message of this book is, you know, it's going to culminate in fascism. I mean, it, it couldn't have been harsher. Rand was just outraged. Well, um, she's, and it she's really, also Jewish by birth, so it's, it's not very tasteful right. either. Also, it's a pretty horrific. Very, um, very tasteless yeah. review. Very tasteless review. It's interesting, though, that Rothbard, so who had this kind of checkered relationship with Rand, when it came out, he, like, peppered Chambers with these letters saying, like, how could you write this horrible thing? Like, you're a horrible person. And then like five years later, he's writing to Chambers again. And he's like, oh, my God, you were right. How did you know? How could you tell? You just read that book and you knew exactly I went through it all. It's exactly what happened to me. And so, um, you know, he put Chambers put his finger on something important about Rand. But it, it also was a, a really intense review. Very negative. And I think there's a bit of you know, um, discrimination going on for Rand for kind of daring to play in these circles as a woman who wasn't particularly certified or educated or didn't have a, you know, connections in the United States. They're just sort of like, who are you? Like, you know, you're not part of our movement. Get away. And so then the kind of irony of that story is that Rand would never go away. I mean, National Review had to keep publishing articles about her. Like every couple of years, they'd have to publish an article about Ayn Rand because their readers loved her so much. So, you know, what I was sort of showing as a historian is there there's this conflict and it's never really resolved. It's just a tension that's always there and it's always being just kind of worked through in different ways. I mean, it's it's still around today. It's shocking. Um, it just while you're telling that story, I just reminded reading in your book that she was on the tonight show i think mm -hmm. how many times I, this is probably a couple times i don't know but more than figure. once and and just to imagine that is is hard. it's just hard to imagine that it reminds me i've mentioned this before but when when i've gone back to read uh barry goldwater's acceptance speech at least i think this is the one i'm thinking of in the 1964 convention and you compare it to a modern uh acceptance speech of a of a of a politician accepting a presidential nomination how much the world has changed in those 50 years is, is just – it's just so striking in terms of the intellectual level and the content and the sophistication. The idea that Ayn Rand would be on The Tonight Show debating you know, whatever she was debating, whatever she was talking about is just – it's – there's something surreal about it now. 
I mean, she really was an intellectual celebrity. She was on the TV shows. Um, she was, you know, quoted in um, the New York Times and other places. She did college tours regularly to overflow crowds. Um, you know, she was a very popular speaker on campus. She was sort of bringing that provocative viewpoint. Um, she had just speaking invitation after speaking invitation. I mean, she turned down most of them. She only did a few. And um, she really was a, a kind of touchstone in that moment. And she still is today. I mean, there's, you know, references to Ayn Rand on The Simpsons and in, you know, movies, that, you know, Mad Men television show. Like, it's just constant. She's a constant touchstone of a certain type of, you know, a certain a certain personality type, a certain set of ideas, a certain moment in people's lives, um, a certain piece of American political culture. I mentioned when we started this conversation that I had gotten less, that I was enamored of her as a teenager, intellectually enamored of her, and then got turned off by the the lack of um, recognition of the role that caring for others has in our lives and community and other things. Uh, but, and this but's important, and I, I mentioned earlier her her moral defense of capitalism. I think it's really important. Uh, you're an historian. I'm just speaking from my own personal perspective here. I think it's incredibly important that somebody defends the morality of freedom and the morality of capitalism. And we've gotten so far away from that that reading those uh, quotes from her, is, it's a breath of fresh air. It reminds me of uh, – I read a biography of uh, Maggie Thatcher recently. And when you read what Thatcher said about liberty, it's just so jarring because it's so out of step with – pe- politicians couldn't say those things anymore. And so I think it's incredibly important, and I even have sympathy for Rand's – romanticization of business. But I do also think that was dangerous. I think it's unfortunate that she romanticized business because I think she helped people become confused about capitalism and business. So I'm pro-capitalist, but I'm not pro-business. And I think she was pro-both. And I was sh- I was kind of shocked by how, and I didn't know about this, when Atlas Shrugged came out, how many business people you know were excited about it because it was, yeah, I'm an okay guy. I'm okay. Mm-hmm. I'm a good person. It's okay to be, to just care about profit. And although you know, part of me rebels a little bit against that. At the same time, I understand that if you never defend that, if no one's out there defending that, uh, freedom's going to have a, a tough time flourishing. Yeah, I mean, it's. I do think there's something um, the sort of core moral insight about the the worth and the the sort of intrinsic value and intrinsic irreplaceability of of each individual person, that's, that's really valuable. It's timeless. And it's not just in Rand, obviously it's in, you know, most religious systems, it's in our founding documents of our country, you know, and it's, it's an ideal more often observed in the breach, but someone does have to say it's an ideal and, and sort of stand up for it. I think looking at Rand's oeuvre as a whole and looking at her writing and her fiction, that message can get muddied in her very fiction, you know, for all that um, discussion of the individual, you know, a lot of her, um, there's a lot of emphasis, particularly in Atlas Shrugged, on um, aristocracy. Yeah, and so and just... not, yeah, not natural aristocracy. You know, like this wonderfully talented person. Although you could say John Galt is sort of an example of that. But she'll go on and on about this, you know, heir to this and that copper kingdom, and the, you know, the long family that runs the, you know, Central Railroad, and you know, and paint these people as sort of, as you know, as blood aristocrats in some way and i can understand why people read that and see it find it very uncomfortable and find it uncomfortable set of messages in that um and find messages that are at variance with this sort of stated content of you know the individual qua individual is only what matters now you point out that capitalism and freedom by milton Friedman was written shortly after atlas shrugged and has some uh much in common with it intellectually uh I don't think I don't think Friedman particularly drew on it, but they they let's say it this way they they mined similar themes, and in particular they both disliked greatly the uh, John F. Kennedy quote: "Ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country." And you write the following: you say um, Friedman's association with the University of Chicago and his technical work in economics insulated him against the type of attacks Rand endured. Close quote. Now, I'm kind of skeptical of that claim. I think Friedman was often mocked and treated with disdain for a long, long time. Uh, would you change that sentence now that you're working on a Friedman biography? Um, it's interesting. I think I think what I was getting at in that is um, the sort of figure of ridicule, public figure of ridicule. And I do know now that I'm a little more granular in Friedman. There was 
you know, probably a decade or so in his professional life when he was seen to have sort of turned away from the more interesting work in economics and really gone backwards. Um, and then eventually I think he'll kind of reemerge as a force to be reckoned with that, that people have to deal with, even if they're still dislike his politics. So um, I guess I'm going to maybe put an asterisk by that right now. I still think that when Friedman sort of appeared on TV, in the media, you know, he was treated as a serious economist with serious ideas. And some of the coverage of Rand is just very ad hominem, attacks how she looks, what she says, her accent, that people around her are weird, she's weird, this whole thing is a joke. Oh my God, how did we get here? Like, I don't think you see, or I haven't seen in the media that coverage of Friedman yet. I've seen him presented, even when he's presented negatively, it's sort of a a, a dangerous foe we have to watch out for, not a ridiculous person that it's unbelievable people take seriously. And that's a, a lot of the tone of coverage of Rand in the 60s is is really noticeable for that. That's interesting. I think it's mainly a difference between the public, the media, and then academia. So I think yeah. the public and the media have been respectful of Friedman more or less partly because of that credential he has, the fact that he was a University of Chicago professor, eventually he has the Nobel Prize. But – uh, among fellow academics, there was a, a lot of people thought he was a kook, thought he was crazy, uh, thought he was dangerous, and hated him uh, for yeah. his for his policy positions. Um, I'm I'm curious how. Um, I, let, let me say, let me rephrase this. Uh, your views on Ayn Rand's philosophy do not come through in the book, which is a tribute to your uh, scholarship and your even handedness. And your role as a historian. I think you can read this book and have no idea what Jennifer Burns thinks of Ayn Rand. Um, and I'm not going to ask you now. You can talk about it if you want. But I, I'm more curious about the social aspect of it, which is I'm curious how your friends and family reacted to the fact that your book's pretty even-handed. Because I suspect, like you said, there are plenty of people out there you probably know and love who a few of them might like Ayn Rand. I bet a lot of them don't like her. And uh, what was their reaction to the book? And what was the reaction uh, academically among historians? Yeah, I think. Um, uh, well, I will take that as a compliment because, it, yeah, I, I mean, the, I the center. St I wanted I wanted Rand to be the center stage, not me and what I happen to think. Um, I feel like that's less interesting. Um, but um, I think, by and large, that the reception has been positive, um, especially within the academic community. I would say. Um, a lot of people were curious about Rand and were sort of like, we're curious, but we don't want to sit down and read all those books. So like, phew, like you, we can read your book instead. And your book is really interesting. And then like now I feel more informed. So I think there was sort of that gratitude. It's very much been part of the convention of the field to try um, to understand the person and the people you're writing about. Um, so, you know, that's considered the mark of, of good history rather than to sort of pull rank on these people who were born earlier than you were and point out all the things they got wrong and all the things that, you know, we're now more enlightened about. Like that's, um, you know, I think people critique and, and point out uh, flaws and errors, but try not to be too heavy handed. So that was very much my approach. Um, I mean, I don't think I necessarily let Rand off easy because I, I think I show how it worked and didn't work for her. And, you know, she had she sort of tested out her ideas in her life and they led her to certain places. And that the object lesson to me is kind of in, in the events as they happened. Um, so I think Fair enough, um, but, but you don't in terms of the public policy issues, uh, your feelings about capitalism, your feelings about government regulation, your feelings about wealth redistribution, the welfare state. I have no idea where Jennifer Byrne stands after reading that book. And I think that's that. I take that as a compliment. Other people might view that as a negative. I don't. I think that's very um, – uh, the book comes across very – as a very dispassionate portrait, and some of the some of the vehemence that I felt from it is my interpretation, by the way, not yours. So yeah, yeah. I, I think – Well, that's also I, – I wanted to kind of create a space because I had seen that bookshelf where I wanted both both people to read the book and to kind of create this, like, discursive space where you could be in it and not feel like you weren't allowed in the book because – you already had some set of opinions that the author was going to be judging, you know? So I really, that was very deliberate. Um, I think, you know, the other thing you know, that this, this with Milton Friedman, by the way, cause he's great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, this worked because it was a university press, you know, and at a certain point in time, I looked at uh, more of a trade press and I, the, you know, one editor told me very bluntly in, in publishing or singing to the choir, 
you got to figure out which choir you want to sing to and sing to that one. And I was like, eh, that's not really what I want to do because like I, I could write that book about Ayn Rand, like, like with my eyes closed, that's not interesting. That's not challenging. That's not hard to do. Anybody can do that. That's not what I want to do. Um, and so in terms of my friends and family, they were just delighted that so many people wanted to read this book and talk about it. They thought it was really interesting. Um, you know, I talked to a lot of them about it. Um, you know, some of them were mad because they had to read Ayn Rand before, like they felt obligated to read Ayn Rand while I was writing this book. So I did get a few people who were like, oh my God, I read Ayn Rand because of you, <laughs> you know, who, who really didn't like that experience. But, um, I would say I, I, and I also, I also wrote the book to last, you know, I didn't want you to pick up the book and be like, oh my God, this is so 2009, yeah. you know, with like an epilogue that talks about whatever, pet policy idea everyone was obsessed with for six months and now is completely forgotten about. You know, I think a good book of history um, should have a lot of staying power. And so that that was another goal of mine. So one of the questions I've, I mentioned that Ayn Rand's come up a few times on this program, one of the questions I've raised uh, at some point in the past is how it is that a book like Atlas Shrugged can continue to sell in huge numbers. How it is that supposedly, according to Reader's Digest, which is not in your book, I noticed, at least if it is, I missed it, that according to a Reader's, Reader's Digest poll, it's the number two most influential book in people's lives after the Bible. Ironic. Um, and yet we don't live in a very Randian world. And one of the answers to that, one of my answers has always been, well, people didn't – some people like the capitalist part and the um, – and the celebration of free markets and economic freedom. But what people really liked, what really spoke to them, and the reason it has this staying power is the emphasis on, I would call it, uh, the will to happiness, the will to control your life, the idea that you can be strong and step out of the crowd, stand on two feet at the top of the mountain, ideally controlling uh, fire at your finger trips while you're smoking right. a cigarette in her a lot of her <laughs> – Set pieces have this romanticization of smoking, which is weird. But at any rate, putting that little part to the side, this idea that somehow you can control your destiny. And I think that's what – that's my, my idea has always been that that's what spoke deepest to people. Uh, what do you think is the reason that it's been so successful and yet not had that big an impact, I would say, on policy? Um, yeah, I think, you know, everything you say is true and there's – you have to kind of – I focused a lot on the, the political aspects of it just because I thought that hadn't really been looked at. But there's a there's an apolitical piece that that speaks to all those themes about self-discovery, self-knowledge, self-recognition, self-cultivation. And that's that's really powerful. Um, you know, I if the policy hasn't changed, the, the politics at least have that there's a fairly robust, multi-layered, multi-strain conservative movement out there, um, most of which is critical of what they say is liberalism or statism. And Rand has funneled people into that for, for decades. Um, I think she's maybe less now. I'm not sure. Kind of jury's still out. I wrote something for the Washington Post about that called Ayn Rand is Dead, like wondering where what she's doing in the current political environment. I think that's a little unclear. But, you know, she's she's set people's minds in a certain way. She's opened their, their reading list to, to people they might not consider. And if the policy hasn't changed yet, at least we're in an environment where people talk about it. And that conversation has been going on for quite some time. I don't know if it takes um, I don't know what it takes to 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 move the policy more in those anti-government directions. And it may also be the other thing is the bigger the government gets or the more people object to it, the more popular it is to read about um, criticisms of the government, because the more evident it is in people's lives and it's more like it's more of a target. Right. So. And they could also be related that the, the failure of the policy she promotes and the popularity of reading about how great it will be when they succeed, those could be related. My guest today has been Jennifer Burns. Her book is Goddess of the Market, Ayn Rand and the American Right. Jennifer, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.